Welcome to the deep dive. Today, we're uh, really diving into some fascinating materials you've pulled together, all centered around Ray Kurzweil and his, well, his vision for this incredibly fast-paced future we seem to be heading towards. That's right. We're going to focus on what exponential change really means, especially when we talk about AI, nanotechnology, and biotech. And our mission for you, listening in, is to help you get a solid handle on the key arguments, maybe some of the more uh, surprising predictions Kurzweil and these sources make about the near future. Exactly. We want you to grasp the essence, the big picture of what might be coming without getting totally bogged down in, you know, super technical jargon. Quick, but thorough. Makes sense. And obviously, Kurzweil's ideas are central here, especially this concept of the singularity and, you know, that point where change becomes just radically fast and the exponential trends driving it all. Plus, we've got some other interesting background stuff a bit on computing history, AI capabilities, how the brain works, nanotech potential, even how society has been progressing overall. OK, so the big question we'll keep circling back to is, what are the absolute must-know takeaways from all this about technology's future and, well, us, humanity? And maybe what are those little details, those surprising bits that make you go, wow, really? Let's get into it. Let's do it. Starting with that core idea, the exponential pace of change. Kurzweil's big point is we're not just climbing a hill anymore. We've hit the super steep part of the curve. Yeah, it's accelerating fast. Huh. And the evidence for this is really clear when you look at um, the cost versus performance of computing power. Oh, definitely. The sources lay out this incredible journey tracking how many calculations you get per second for the same amount of money, basically, over decades. It's pretty mind-blowing. Like back in 1939, the Z2 computer, tiny fraction of a calculation per second per dollar, like... 0. 0.000065 or something. Right. Then jump to 1965. The PDP-8 gets you maybe 1.8 calculations. Then whoosh, 1990, it's 1700 with a 48060X. And it just keeps leaping. Pentium 3rd and 19 hits 800,000. Yeah. Pentium 4 in 2005, 12 million. And now, early 2024, things like Google's TPU V5e. Hmm. We're talking estimates around 130 billion billion operations per second per dollar. It's just ah. hard to even grasp that scale of change. It really is. And connecting this to Kurzweil's own timeline, one source points out something fascinating. Right now, today, we're probably closer to seeing the first superhuman AI emerge than we are to when his book How to Create a Mind came out in 2012. Wow. And we're also likely closer to the singularity itself than we are to his earlier book, The Age of Spiritual Machines from 1999. So babies born today. Their lifetime will see changes that were pure science fiction just, what, 20 or 30 years ago. Absolutely. So a key takeaway right there is the sheer velocity of this. It's happening incredibly fast. And the speed leads to some truly mind-bending predictions. Like, Kurzweil foresees, maybe in the 2030s, us connecting our neocortex, the thinking part of our brain, directly to the cloud. Yeah, not just using AI tools, but actually merging with AI to extend our own minds. It shifts the whole idea from AI as a competitor to AI as, well, Part of us. An extension of ourselves. Exactly. And the potential boost in thinking power is enormous. The non-biological part, the AI side, could offer thousands of times more capacity than our biological brains alone. Imagine that. And if this keeps growing exponentially, Kurzweil's projection for 2045 is that we could expand our mental capacity by millions of times. Which is why he uses that term singularity, right? Borrowed from physics, it signifies a point where the old rules just don't apply anymore, where things become fundamentally different, maybe even unpredictable. OK, so that naturally brings us to AI itself. How did it evolve? The sources mentioned the Dartmouth conference back in 56. That's where the term artificial intelligence was coined. Right, though Kurzweil apparently isn't keen on artificial, feels it implies something fake or lesser. Interesting. And the initial goal there was huge. Get machines to understand natural language like we speak. Ambitious. They didn't crack it in two months, obviously. But that quest is still ongoing, just with, you know, vastly more people and resources thrown at it now. The numbers are wild. Tencent guessed maybe 300,000 AI researchers globally in 2017. By 2021, nearly half a million publications and over 140,000 patents in just one year. Exponential growth right there. And the approach to building AI has changed dramatically, too. Early stuff, symbolic AI, was all about programming and rules. Like telling a computer exactly how to think step by step. Yeah, but the problem is, first, crafting perfect rules is basically impossible. And second, even if you could, how do we even know which rules are best? Our own logic isn't always optimal. Good point. So that led to connectionist AI neural networks. 
deep learning, these systems learn from data instead. Right. Like the corgi example they give. You don't tell it pointy ears, fluffy tail. You just show it tons of pictures labeled corgi or not corgi. And it figures it out. Pretty much. It strengthens connections that lead to right answers, weakens ones that lead to wrong answers based on feedback. Eventually, it builds its own internal representation of corginess. That's powerful, but it also leads to that black box issue, doesn't it? The AI gets the right answer, but we don't always know why. Exactly. And that's a big deal for high stakes stuff like medical diagnosis or legal decisions. You need to understand the reasoning. So there's a huge push now for transparency, for um, mechanistic interpretability, making the black box less black. What's really surprising, though, is how well these networks handle noisy data. The source mentions experiments where even if like 40 percent of the training labels are wrong, the network can still learn and get over 90 percent accuracy. Yeah, that robustness is pretty remarkable. They seem to be incredibly good at finding the underlying patterns, even when the input is kind of messy. Definitely a surprising detail. OK, so how does this machine intelligence compare to ours? The source draws a neat contrast between our cerebellum and our neocortex. Right. The cerebellum, older part of the brain, handles more fixed automatic stuff, like the specific muscle movements for playing piano versus riding a bike. Mm. Very specialized, like how different mice species have their own specific way of digging burrows. It's innate. Whereas the neocortex, that's the flexible learning part. It handles those rich, interconnected memories. The source compares it to a Wikipedia page, constantly updated, linked everywhere. Yeah, and triggered by anything, a smell, a sound. Mm. And this structure enables something really key to human thought, analogical thinking. Connecting patterns across totally different domains. Exactly. Like recognizing the pattern of going down applies to lowering your hand, lowering your voice pitch, a falling temperature, even the decline of an empire. It seems abstract, but the brain sees a similar pattern. And that's where big leaps happen, like Darwin seeing parallels between species evolution and geological changes. Precisely. That ability to bridge disparate concepts is fundamental. And now AI is starting to show glimmers of this even while it surpasses us in specific games like Go. Right, AlphaGo beating Keji was huge, but then AlphaGo Zero learned with no human games as input. Just played itself. And got even better. Then AlphaZero learned Go, Chess, and Shugi. That's transfer learning, applying knowledge from one task to another. A very human-like trait. And MuZero didn't even need the rules explained. That's mind-blowing. It really is. Another area is understanding meaning from context, like the word jam. Traffic jam versus strawberry jam. Exactly. AI learns the difference from how the word is used, just like we do when we learn vocabulary growing up. It's not just dictionary definitions. And OpenAI's CLKI P project linking images and text, that shows conceptual understanding, right? Recognizing spider, whether it's a photo, a drawing of Spider-Man, or just the word. Yeah, it suggests a deeper, more abstract representation, kind of like how our brains seem to handle concepts across different senses. Maybe the most surprising bit, though, is AI getting humor. That's a tough one. Humor is so layered, wordplay, irony, shared context. But Google's Paul M model could apparently read jokes and explain why they were funny. The example given about the language model distracting someone from writing and the AI nailing the explanation, that's impressive, shows a really complex grasp of language and human situations. Definitely a surprising detail. And all this ties back to Kurzweil's Law of Accelerating Returns, or LOAR. His core argument that exponential progress is the engine driving all these trends, like that snowball rolling downhill, getting bigger and faster. But it's important to get it right. LOIR doesn't apply to everything. It's specifically about technologies that improve information processing, things that create feedback loops. Like the printing press made information cheaper and faster, enabling more innovation, which led to... Computers, which process information even faster, leading to cheaper broadband, which spreads information even wider. It feeds itself. Moore's Law is just one famous example of this deeper process. Okay, but as things accelerate this much, it raises some really deep questions about, well, us, our identity, consciousness. Absolutely. The source asks that basic question, who am I in this potential future? How does consciousness fit in? We see different levels, maybe, across species, rodents, insects, even amoebae react to stimuli. Is there a link between neural complexity and subjective experience? It's a huge philosophical debate. The source mentioned Stephen Wolfram's work on Cellular Automata too. Simple rules, but leading to incredibly complex, unpredictable behavior. Like you can't just calculate the future state, you have to actually run the simulation step by step. Exactly. 
which suggests maybe the universe itself, or even a complex brain, can't be fully predicted in advance. You have to let it unfold. So digitally emulating a brain might be possible, but predicting its every future thought and action? Maybe not, because it's constantly interacting with new information. Right, it's an open system. And this leads to the idea of gradually transferring our minds. We already have things like cochlear implants, even early hippocampal aids for memory. And people with those implants don't feel like they've lost their sense of self, do they? Doesn't seem like it. The information, the patterns that make up you, are being processed, just partly on a different substrate. It suggests identity might persist through such a transition. But then there's the U2 thought experiment. What if there's a perfect digital copy of you? Yeah, that raises tricky legal and ethical questions. If U2 believes it has its own subjective experience, how do we treat it? Likely as a separate entity, even if we can't prove its inner experience. It really makes you think about how improbable our own existence is. The source goes into the odds. Astronomical. The specific sperm, the specific egg, the unbroken chain of ancestors, the probability of you specifically existing is just vanishingly small. One in two quintillion or something just for the sperm egg combo. Plus the spontaneous origin of life itself, which seems incredibly unlikely. And the universe's fundamental constants being just right for life. Fred Hoyle's quote about it being like a tornado assembling a 747 from a junkyard. It highlights the sheer unlikelihood. So how do we preserve this incredibly improbable identity in the future? The source suggests, first, preserving the information, the ideas, memories, feelings that define us. We're already creating vast digital records of ourselves, consciously or not. And the next step is animating that data, creating realistic simulations. Apparently, yes. The prediction is we could have highly realistic non-biological simulations by the end of this decade. AI tech like Transformers and Jans are getting scarily good at mimicking human writing, voice, appearance. Transformers understand context and sequences. Jians create realistic fakes by competing. Right. They're powerful tools for imitation. And then physical bodies. Virtual or augmented reality first, but maybe convincing androids using nanotech later, like in the late 2030s. Though making androids that can actually do complex physical tasks is still hard more of X paradox. Easy for us, hard for robots. True. And the conductor example reminds us we value more than just technical skill. We value the person, the relationship. Now this exponential progress, it's not just about computers and AI, is it? The law of accelerating returns affects other areas too. Definitely. Though public perception often lags. As the source notes with examples like people overestimating crime rates or benefit fraud, progress can be happening even if we don't always feel it directly. Think about past information tech shifts. Radio created a national culture. TV changed everything, even though its adoption rate eventually plateaued. And looking ahead, the source talks about a third bridge for life extension. Medical nanorobots. Mm. Tiny machines doing cellular repair inside us. Like having microscopic mechanics maintaining our bodies from the inside out, maybe in the 2030s. That's the idea. Addressing aging at the root. And we see broader progress, too. Global poverty falling, incomes rising, remote work becoming mainstream thanks to tech, democracy slowly spreading. And underlying it all is that falling cost and rising power of computation. The phone in your pocket out vastly outperforming room-sized computers from decades ago. That deflation in IT costs is fundamental, and it's bleeding into the physical world. Physical goods are becoming information technologies. Like 3D printing, turning digital blueprints into actual objects. Exactly. And open source designs are flourishing alongside proprietary ones. Think about food, too. Vertical farms, clean meat grown from cells, mm. potentially much cheaper, better for the environment. Solar power getting exponentially cheaper and more efficient. Huge potential there. Water purification tech like the slingshot machine. And 3D printing is moving way beyond plastic trinkets. We're talking complex materials, custom medical implants that deliver drugs, nanomaterials. AI helps optimize the designs. Even houses. Printing modular homes quickly or entire custom buildings. It's happening now. And in medicine, shifting drug trials to computer simulations in silico trials. Faster, cheaper, potentially safer. Plus breakthroughs like immunotherapy, CRT cells, using IPS cells to regenerate tissues. It's all converging. Okay, let's pull some of this together. The big picture seems to be this relentless, accelerating technological wave driven by information processing improvements. Right. It's impacting everything from 
AI merging with us to nanotech potentially fixing us at a cellular level to how we make food and build houses. It points towards radical transformation, maybe even abundance. There have to be downsides, challenges, right? It can't all be smooth sailing. Absolutely not. Job displacement is a huge one. AI and automation replacing human workers. The source mentions an Oxford study flagging lots of occupations, like drivers, as having high automation risk. Echoes of the Luddite smashing machines centuries ago, perhaps. There are parallels. Though historically, technology eventually created new jobs. The concern now is whether it happens fast enough, and if the new jobs require skills many people don't have. There's also the productivity paradox, all this IT advancement, yet measured productivity growth has slowed in many places. One explanation is that GDP doesn't capture all the value. Like, free information online adds huge consumer surplus, but doesn't boost GDP figures much. Still, the benefits aren't always evenly distributed. Healthcare costs, for example, have often outpaced inflation. Though, the potential is there for technology to empower humans in new ways, like artistic expression, maybe things we can't even imagine yet. And safety nets have generally expanded over time, at least in places like the U.S. Famines today are more often caused by bad governance or war, not an actual lack of global resources. Which highlights a key risk, mm -hmm. politics. Toxic politics or bad governance could derail progress or misuse powerful technologies. Definitely. Public understanding and sensible regulation are crucial especially for things like advanced healthcare tech. Think about the misinformation around vaccines. That's a warning sign for how advanced nanomedicine might be received. And there's the tension between diffuse benefits, millions get slightly cheaper travel with autonomous cars, versus concentrated harms, thousands of drivers lose their jobs. Managing those transitions is tough. But the potential upside is immense. AI could massively accelerate biomedical research, leading to personalized cures. Nanotechnology opens the door to molecular manufacturing. Building things atom by atom, like von Neumann's universal constructor idea? Kind of. There was the Drexler-Smalley debate about feasibility, fat fingers trying to manipulate atoms, sticky fingers getting atoms stuck. But the potential, if achieved, is radical abundance. Materials are cheap. The value is in the information, the design. And the source touches on the timeline for maybe digitalizing the brain, comparing brain computation power to Moore's law projections. It suggests it might become affordable within a few decades, though that's obviously a huge leap. But alongside these promises come serious risks. New military tech, like those Russian nuclear-powered drones and missiles. Needing AI-driven defenses just to keep up. Right. And nanotech risks the gray goo scenario of self-replicating nanobots running amok or cheap, easy manufacturing of devastating weapons. fail and maybe even a nanoimmune system would be essential. And then there's super intelligent AI itself. Mm. Misuse by bad actors is one thing, but also the alignment problem. Yeah, the genie problem. Telling an AI to cure cancer, and it designs a virus that kills cancer cells, but also has unintended catastrophic side effects because we didn't specify the constraints perfectly. Outer misalignment. Can we even restrict this kind of fundamental research? Probably not entirely. The okay. knowledge spreads, but the source notes encouraging signs like governments starting to pay attention, the Bletchley Declaration on AI safety, integrating AI with human values, maybe through market mechanisms and close human oversight, seems key. So it's a balancing act, a moral imperative to pursue the immense promise while actively working to mitigate the very real perils. Exactly. We managed to avoid global nuclear war, despite the capability. Hopefully, we can navigate these new powerful technologies with similar foresight. Kurzweil's concluding dialogue in one source basically says, even if you disagree on specifics like how much the biological brain matters going forward, everyone agrees to found changes are coming, and soon. Okay, so wrapping up this deep dive, the key takeaway really feels like this relentless exponential acceleration is real, measurable, and reshaping almost everything. Yeah, the merging of humans and AI, smarter machines, nanotech, biotech, it all points to a future that's gonna be radically different. More potential, maybe more abundance, definitely transformed human capabilities. And that intriguing detail to mull over, AI understanding a joke, or just the sheer power packed into your phone compared to the past, it really shifts your frame of reference for what's possible, doesn't it? It does. Which leads to that open question for you listening. What are the big ethical hurdles? What societal changes do you think are most vital to handle this responsibly? What excites you? What worries you most about these possible futures? We really hope you'll dig deeper into some of this. Look into the specific tech 
the ethical debates, the societal shifts. Because this future isn't just something that's going to wash over us. We're all involved in shaping it, whether we realize it or not. Thanks for joining us on The Deep Dive.